God will give you what you ask. Would you mind standing with me in honor of reading God's Word and turn to Luke chapter 17. Luke 17, we're going to be reading verses 20 through the end of the chapter, through 37. Kind of set the tone, get some context for our sermon today. So Luke 20, I'm sorry, 17, verse 20. This is the word of our God. Being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them. The kingdom of God is not coming in ways that can be observed, nor will they say, look, here it is, or there, for behold, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. And he said to the disciples, the days are coming when you will desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and you will not see it. And they will say to you, look there or look here. Do not go out or follow them. For as the lightning flashes and lights up the sky from one side to the other, so will the Son of Man be in his day. But first, he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. Just as it was in the days of Noah, so it would be in the days of the Son of Man. They were eating and drinking and marrying and being given in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark. And the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, just as it was in the days of Lot, they were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building. But on that day when Lot went out from Sodom, fire and sulfur rained from heaven and destroyed them all. So will it be on the day the Son of Man is revealed. On that day, let the one who is on the housetop with his goods in the house not come down to take them away. And likewise, let the one who is in the field not turn back. Remember Lot's why? Whoever seeks to preserve his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life will keep it. I tell you, in that night there will be two in one bed. One will be taken, the other left. There will be two women grinding together. One will be taken, the other left. And they said to him, Where, Lord? And he said, Where the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. And he said, Pray. Father, this is your word. I pray right now that you would speak to your people this morning. Lord, hearts that came in hard and callous will be soft, that ears that are closed will be open, that eyes that are closed will see, that Lord, by your Holy Spirit, you speak to us what we need. Lord, may you bring glory to your name and all of you. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Good morning, Faith Church. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Adam Goodwin, and uh, I'm going to put up a little picture. This, this is my family, um, in case you don't know us. Um, so my wife and I, we lead a life group on Wednesday nights. Uh, we got any in here tonight? We uh, are. We got any? Yeah, we got you. Shout out to y'all. And uh, so this is my family. This is my beautiful wife, Sarah, on the far right. And this was taken at actually our life group Christmas party uh, this year. Um, we have been married for seven and a half years. Correct? Right? <laughs> I'm wavered on that for Sarah. So to be honest, I was seven, eight. Um, but then I remember we have a six year old, which makes sense. So we have had four kids at that time. Uh, Emma is six. She's on the left with the little puppy dog. And then we got Luke in the green. He's five. And Jane, well, curly-headed, crazy one, that's her. She's three. And the littlest one is Ben. Also, as I told the first service, he's been his Ben Ben, Baby Ben, Little Ben. He's the baby. So he can talk about that. So, uh, fun fact, um, we are getting close to getting out of the baby's age, which Sarah is grieving and I am rejoicing, <laughs> which means no more diapers. We're hoping in the next you know, six to months to figure that done with diapers forever. Um, bad part, though, about that is, is he's growing and learning new things, and one of those would be he's learning how to crawl out of his crib. And uh, he did it like 10 times one day this morning. So, uh, you know, that's kind of what you get. You get and take. So, that's my family. Um, and so, I just want to show that to you so you kind of know who we are as I speak to you this morning. Um, and to transition into our sermon this morning, which is going to be on prayer 
and not losing heart. I want to kind of share with you a little bit of an illustration from our own life about persisting in prayer. Um, about, let's see, what it would be, 2014, um, I'll just give you some context. And so I worked for Walmart for nine years. So I was a sales associate forever during my time in college, then I transitioned to Bible college, and then I ended up going to seminary in Louisville, where I met my wife. And um, I worked for Walmart the whole time. And um, it was a great job for us. And then when we found out we were having Emma, uh, we needed, I needed more money. So we moved back to Alabama, took an assistant manager role at Walmart and, uh, at Gardendale, Alabama. And I was there for almost three years, just, just about right after three years. Um, about two years in, I think we were learning this is not what God was going to have us. And so we started praying, asking God to open the doors. Well, He didn't. And we were waiting and waiting and waiting. All right, what are we going to do? Well, uh, about a year later after that process, the Lord opened up the door for me to uh, go to LifeWay. You know, I was going to become a manager for LifeWay Christian Stores. And I uh, found out I had my assignment. So I was a manager in training. They were going to send me to Dothan, Alabama, which is South Alabama. Uh, if you've ever been there, you've probably been through there. You don't stop there. Uh, it's got a big circle around the city. And that's kind of, everybody has gone through them. Uh, and so that's kind of where we were at for a year. And But one of the things I want to tell you is that transition was hard for us. And one of the reasons was we had to sell our house and garden out. Of it. And we were having trouble with that. I'm just honest. We were having a really hard time selling our house. And not only that, but in the process, we finally had somebody and we got an inspection done. And guess what? Foundation issues. Oh, it's like the worst thing that we could possibly have on it. Well, guess what? We just bought the house two years before, and this is a little bit of a surprise to us. Like, we wanted to go to that inspector and not have nice words with him because they like, you know, we could have missed this. Well, long story short, is we had to take the less of the options to fix that. It was about $5,000, which we did not have. And so we had to take one on that to, to get it covered just to be able to sell the house. Well, we kept trying to sell the house, and it wasn't happening. And, all right, in the meantime, we moved down to Dover now. We've been there for four months, and thankfully, Lifeway provided a, like a benefit to where they would kind of help us with our dual housing for a period of time. We had six months, okay? Well, guess what? Five months came, house hadn't sold yet. So we were praying, and, and one of the things I want to encourage you is, at that point, about a week into five months, we had a buyer. And not only that, but it was a family that we had even hosted in our home, had done Bible studies with them, uh, had been praying with them, eating with them, and they needed a home. They were ready to buy it. So we were able to do that. And at the same time, God was able to help us sell it to them. We were able to have some excess money to pay off that loan. And even, I think I was even able to to, pay, uh, to, to get a car, because uh, my was like, it was kind of like a girl car that I, I had a car that was just a sweet ride. Sweet ride. Mine was not so sweet anymore. It was really bitter. Um, and so we had to get rid of that. So the Lord had provided. And one of the things I want to tell you is the testimony is that through that time, like the Lord was teaching us to persist in prayer. You better believe every day and every night we were praying, the Lord sell this house. Because when six months hit, I cannot pay for two mortgages. I don't know how that's going to happen. I don't know. I ask you to do that. My wife stays at home with the kids. The Lord's provided. So you can do it. And, you know, when I think about it, often, for many of us, when you think about life circumstances, when trials come, hardships come, many of us have a few different responses. So some of you, if you're like me, who may struggle with pride, you typically do the first one. You say, I got this. When trials come, so I'm going to work as hard as I can, I'm going to do what I can, I'm going to hustle my way through it, I'm going to grit my teeth, pull up myself up on my bootstraps and do it. Well, for many of you know, that doesn't always work. A lot of times it leaves you more pressure. Again, the second option is for some of you who don't have quite, and maybe don't have the confidence to just say, I can do this. But then you go to number two, and you just look around frantically for anything and anyone who can help. Just whatever's closest to me, I'll take it, I'll do it, I'll do whatever. Lord, I need help. I'm just going to, yes, okay, you're there, you can help. I'll take that advice. I'll take this. I'll take, you know, whatever I need to do. Many of you do that, not knowing that they can't help you. It's not going to help you. It doesn't help you. When in reality, what we really need and what is best for us is to go to the one who can do something about it. It's what we should have done in the beginning. 
No, I'm not against us seeking counsel. We have a ministry dedicated to that, and believers should be providing counsel to others. But what I'm saying is our first response is go to God. We go to the one who can do something about it when the trials come. So, this morning, I want to show you from Luke 18, so you can go ahead and flip the page and look at Luke 18. I want to show you this morning from the parable of Jesus. Just that. And we are going to see how even in the midst of the trials, and as we just read in Luke 17, the evil that so closely surrounds us on this earth, our Lord Jesus has called us to be a praying and a persevering people. In short, we are to pray and don't lose heart. And that's the title of my sermon this morning. So pray and don't lose heart. A lesson where you can say a parable for weary disciples. So, let's turn to Luke 18. And he, Jesus, told them a parable to the effect that they always, or ought always, to pray and not lose heart. He said, In a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man, and there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him and saying, Give me justice against my adversary. For a while he refused, but afterward he said to himself, Though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice so that she will not beat me down by her continual coming. And the Lord said, Hear what the unrighteous judge says, and will not God, and then again, and will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find them on earth? Before we begin getting into this, I want to show you a few things. One, this is a parable. So, a parable literally means to, this is your first fill in blank, means to cast alongside. So, what that normally means is often referred to as an earthly story to, that is given to show us a heavenly or a more spiritual meaning. So, that's typically what it is. Now, sometimes, wrongfully, people assume that Jesus taught in parables to make it simple. That is not true. And if you study them, there's even times where he, he's teaching the exact opposite. He's, he's making it hard for them to understand. Um, John MacArthur explains this in, in his book on parables. It was really helpful to show that there are two fold purposes for parables. And here's what they are. They hide or hid truth from self-righteous or self-satisfied people who fancy themselves too sophisticated to learn from Jesus. While the same parables reveal the truth to eager souls with childlike faith, those who are hungry and thirsting for righteousness. So, two, two things here. They hide truth and they reveal truth. And what's the difference there? The posture in which we approach them. So this applies to us this morning. I'm going to challenge you this morning as we dig into this parable. You've got two options. Lord, open my heart. Give me humility of heart to open my heart to understand your word and to apply it. Or this parable will do nothing but bounce off your ears. Because your heart is hard and you do not want to be God. I'm praying that this morning you have been praying that the Lord will open our hearts to understand his word, that he would reveal truth about who he is and who we are in him. So Today's parable of this persistent widow and the unrighteous judge, it's interesting, it's only found in the Gospel of Luke. It's not found in any other Gospel. Um, and unlike many of other parables in the Gospels, it's, it's very helpful. It begins with an interpretive clue to help show us what this parable is about. So, if you were to ever read this parable and come away from it, something other than what the first verse says, you, you need to check your, your Bible study. Because the first verse is explaining to us exactly what it means. So, verse 1 says this. It says, He told them a parable to the effect, or for the purpose of, that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. So the first thing we need to notice, our first point, is that we, as all of Christ, are to pray even when it's hard. We are to pray even when it's hard. Now, one of the first things you need to notice in a couple words in to verse 1 is that and he, Jesus, told them. Now who is the them? Is it the crowd? No, it's not the crowd. He is teaching his disciples. Look back at 17 verse 22. 
and so he had just recently spoke to the Pharisees in verse 20, and then he comes to 22 and says to his disciples, and he's teaching them about his second coming, that he's going to return. And so he's teaching his disciples. One of the gracious gifts that God gives those who he saves, Christ followers, one of the gracious gifts he gives us is the gift of prayer. And what is prayer? Very simply, it's personal communication with our Creator, the God who created us. It's personal communication with Him. That is a privilege and a gift. When Jesus died on the cross and the veil of the temple was torn in two, this once and for all banished the need for an earthly mediator or priest for us to communicate with God. So, church member, you don't have to go to Pastor Chris to get to God. You, under the blood of Christ and the righteousness that He provides through His salvation, can go directly to God. This is a gift that should be a comfort to us as believers. So we as, as Christ followers have the privilege of going to God in prayer because of the sacrificial death of Jesus and the powerful resurrection and the life that He gives. This is a gift. And hear me, it is not to be taken for granted. For as we will see today, our prayers are effective. They matter. This parable speaks to something that we can all identify with. If you're in this room, I know you can identify with this. This is a common tendency for us to give up and stop praying before we receive an answer from God. Now, who can identify with that? We, we give up too quickly. We stop praying before we get an answer from God. We can all identify with this. So our first point this morning, under praying even when it's hard, is this. Christ followers should expect things to get difficult. Should fill in the blank. Christ followers should expect things to get difficult. And where am I getting that? So go to 17 verse 22 in the context previously. And he said to his disciples, the days are coming when you will desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man and you will not see it. You know what he's saying there? Days are coming when it is going to get very, very hard for you. Life is going to be hard. There's going to be evil surrounding you. You're going to be persecuted for your faith. There will be hardship and trials and struggles. And you're going to want me to come back. And I'm not coming yet. Come on. Now, that's what he's teaching us at this point. It's going to get hard. The entire Luke 17 discourse, as MacArthur says, is dominated by warning of doom and sudden disaster. It's there. It's culminating in this gruesome image at the end of 17 of death and destruction. It says that where the corpse is, there the vultures were gathered. This is not a pretty picture. Life's about to get hard for you. You're going to want me to return. So what does he have to say to them? Christ followers should expect things to be difficult. Even promises. Even teaches them that in, in John 15, 20, you may be familiar with this, that if they persecuted me, they will persecute you. And then even to kind of continue this of it being hard, the end of verse 18, uh, verse, I'm sorry, 18, 1, it says what? They always ought to pray in what? Not lose heart. Doesn't that imply that the following Jesus is going to be difficult? There's going to be a tendency within you to want to give up because it's hard. We should expect things to get hard. There's going to be a natural pull within your flesh or from the enemy to pull away from God, to give up on praying, to stop seeking the things of God. What he's doing here, he's preparing his disciples for the hard days that are in front of him. And I know we need that today. So the first point is Christ followers should expect things to get difficult. Our second point is Christ followers should understand that prayer is hard. So not only is life going to get hard, prayer is hard. Now if anybody would be in here to tell you that prayer is easy, they are not telling the truth in a very subtle way that I'll tell you. Prayer is hard. It is labor. Timothy Keller in his book on prayer has a great quote that I want to read to you this morning. He says this. He says, Prayer is nonetheless an exceedingly difficult subject to write about. And can I say to preach about? It's a 
hard because we, we feel so weak in it, don't we? But he's right. It's, it's an exceedingly difficult subject to write about. That is not primarily because it is so indefinable, but before it, it feels so small and helpless. I can think of nothing great that is also easy. Isn't that true? Prayer must be, then, one of the hardest things in the world. But here's some hope. To admit that prayer is very hard, however, can be encouraging. And if you struggle with this, as I'm, I'm guessing, as even hearing people talk on the way out, we, as we struggle with this, you're not alone. You are not alone. You may even remember in Mark chapter 14, uh, the disciples kept falling asleep in the Garden of Gethsemane. And what did Jesus teach them? Keep telling them. Watch and pray that you do not fall into temptation. Meaning, prayer is hard. It's labor. It's work. It takes effort. It takes discipline. So, Christ followers should understand that prayer is hard. Third, Christ followers, anyway, so despite that it's hard, despite your deep suffering, Christ followers should pray continually. He says that they ought always to pray and not be hard. Now, this is a call to pray continually, not continuous or constant prayer. So we're not recommending that at the end of the service of the day, everybody quit their jobs, leave their families, and go to a monastery somewhere and just pray all day. That's not what we are advising. That's not what the scriptures are teaching here. This is a continual prayer where Prayer is our lifeline that we're doing. Going to God regularly. We're communing with Him. We're talking to Him. Luke speaks about prayer a lot. His gospel and Acts is very unique. So we're going to pull that up here um, and kind of show you some, to kind of better understand what we're dealing with here. So whereas the terms prayer and pray are found only uh, 17 times in Matthew, 13 times in Mark, Luke, they're found 21 times, and in Acts, they're found 35 times. And many would say that Luke Acts is a connected book. They're meant to be read together. So we, we begin with the birth of Christ, we end with the resurrection of Christ, and then we go into he's ascended, and the church is continuing. Here's what is happening. Because Luke wrote both Luke and Acts. So, more significant though, however, and I'll put this up here, is that then the frequency of this concept of Luke Acts is that it occurs at key times and phrases. Let's look at a few of those. So one, Luke 1. 9 through 10 begins with prayer. So the gospel is beginning with the testimony of prayer. Chapter 3, Jesus prays at his baptism. This is only found in the gospel of Luke. Obviously, his baptism is in other places, but praying before his baptism is only found in the gospel of Luke. Jesus chose the 12 in chapter 6 after praying all night. Chapter 9, prayer was given before asking, Who did the crowd say that I am? And, and later in verse 9, at the prayer at the Mount of Transfiguration, it is only found where Jesus is praying as they're going up, only in the Gospel of Luke. Jesus teaches on the Lord's Prayer. Many think of the Lord's Prayer only in Matthew. It's also in Luke, chapter 11, where He's teaching His disciples how to pray. Through prayer, believers are to persist and not lose heart, which is what we're dealing with this morning. Uh, 22, prayer to keep from falling into temptation. And lastly, because of Jesus' prayer, it's really interesting if you want to study it sometime, in, in 2232, Jesus' prayer, uh, because of his prayer, Peter's denial does not result in apostasy, him leaving the faith. Jesus' prayer is effective as he's interceding for his disciples before his resurrection, before his death and resurrection. Clearly, though, for Luke, prayer was seen as a vital, this is important, for Luke, Prayer was seen as a vital and necessary part of the Christian life, both individually and corporately. Now let me apply this real quick. You need to be praying regularly by yourself. If you're not, it's not part of your spiritual walk and walk with the Lord, then needs to change today. It's easy. Go to Matthew 6, go to Luke 11, and Jesus will teach you how to pray. And then just start praying. The second, that's individually. Secondly, we need to be a corporate prayer. We need to be collectively praying together. Some of the ways that can work itself out is, I know the church has prayer meeting on Tuesday morning. We need to 
come, you can't do that? Well, let me give you another idea. This is a shameless plug. Is you need to be a part of a life group or a Bible study where you are studying the Word together, you're having fellowship together, and you're praying together regularly. It is good for our soul. It is essential to the Christian life. We need to be a people who are individually corporately <laughs> praying together. So, in times of hardship, which Jesus has promised and said, it's going to get really, really, really hard. In times of hardship, persistent prayer must be the Christian's lifeline. So if you're struggling, if you're in a hard season, prayer is the captain of your lifeline. And Jesus now transitions to a parable that highlights this truth. So let's look at verse 2 and see the lessons from a determined widow. We're going to learn some lessons from a widow. Verse 2, he said, In a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man. Now, he doesn't sound like a very nice guy, does he? And there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him, the judge, and saying, Give me justice against my adversary. For a while he refused, but afterward he said to himself, Though I neither fear God nor respect man, he's only up to it, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice so that she will not beat me down by her continual coming. Stop there. So the first character we're introduced to this lesson from a widow is the unrighteous judge. It says two things about him. First, it says he neither feared God nor did he respect man. So this idea of not, neither fearing God simply means that he did not know the true judge of all. He didn't know God. He didn't respect Him. He didn't live life and life in Him. He did not know the true judge of all, despite the fact that he is an earthly judge. Secondly, nor did he respect man. His lack of fear before God. So his lack of reverence and lack of who God is floated to his work. Now this is an application point for us this morning. If you're living a life that doesn't fear, and a biblical fear is a, it is a sense of awe and a reverence before God, if your life is not lived in that, it will affect you in your workplace and how you do what you do. Do you hear me real quick? It will affect what you do. It will affect those around you. And that's what's happening with the judge. He doesn't fear God. And guess what? It works itself out in those around him. He doesn't respect people. Because he doesn't understand who God is to know that these people are created in the image of God. So when we live in life with the fear and reverence of God, it changes how we live around others. But what kind of judge was he? So, in, in addition to judges, some of the judges of Israel. So, they have the greater Sanhedrin, the lesser Sanhedrin. Um, uh, Dr. MacArthur shares this, that there was there were some others. That Rome, specifically, had also appointed local magistrates and village judges who judged criminal cases and looked after the interests of the season. Okay? They were the worst of all. And here's, here's why. Notoriously lacking in both morals and scruples, uh, the Jews generally regarded them with the same utter disdain typically shown towards tax collectors. And familiar with the gospel, tax collectors are not looked well upon, are they? These were looked in the same way from the Jews of their day. And from Jesus' description of this judge, it seems very clearly that he was probably talking about one of these Roman appointees with these Roman judges. But even go on a little bit later, he, he even comes back and says, so he's described as a man who neither fears God nor respects man. He even comes back and says, for neither I fear God nor respect man. He even owns up to it. So even by his own confession, he lived in open defiance to the first and second greatest commandments. Loving God with all his heart, soul, mind, and strength, and loving his neighbor as himself. He is a judge of man is living in open defiance for a holy God. It has affected how he lives and does his work. But it's also clear, and now we're looking at this, it's also clear that injustice is a reality in a fallen world. There is real injustice in this world that we live in. So, 
few ways that that can be shown. I'm going to put up a slide here for you real quick. One of those is persecution of Christians around the world. There are millions of Christians all around the world who are persecuted simply for believing in Jesus and nothing more. Not that they harmed anyone, just because they named Christ as Lord and Savior. So, in this last year, and this is from the World Watch List 2019, Open Doors USA uh, is a research organization that provides this. Can we go back to the previous slide real quick? Um, they, they research this, but what's going on in the country, and they provide a list for believers to be praying for. So, in the last year, the number of Christians experiencing high levels of persecution climbed 14%. Counting 245 million individuals globally. In total, one in nine Christians experience high levels of persecution throughout the world. Across Asia and the Middle East, one in three, hear that? One in three Christians face this experience. An estimated over 4,000 Christians were killed for their faith this past year. It's 11 per day just because they believe in Jesus. The top five countries. Right now are North Korea, Afghanistan, Somalia, Libya, and Pakistan. You can go to the next slide and put that back up here again. And this is a map of some of the strongest areas, the top 50, that are going on right now. Let's, let's call this what it is. It's injustice. Simply because they believe in a resurrected Savior, or they persecute the But not only that, there's been some recent issues that have been going on. If you've been keeping up with the news or going on, there's some really disturbing things going on in our country, particularly around the issue of abortion. We have a New York legislation that just went through and towards late-term abortion, and you know what the result was that? Applause. Of course. For applauding the murder of weak, helpless babies. Not only that, we even put a light up in the city to celebrate it. And then, if you been followed even more, there's the governor of Virginia this week who's doubled down on some laws that are being, some bills that are being put forth in Virginia, particularly in late-term abortion, as well as the option that if a baby is even born and they felt like they, if they felt it appropriate, they, the mother and doctor would go together and decide to kill the baby. After, we're talking out of the world. This is horrific. And it should cause us to weep. Pray, plead on behalf of the hurting and the weak in our society. And so, my application for us is are we genuinely praying for the issues of our day? Or are we just arguing about them? Are all your conversations just about arguing about this? Or are you daily, persistently taking these before the Lord to do something about it? It's your prayer, Lord, may your kingdom come, as life gets hard, as the disciples knew it was coming, is our Lord, King, your kingdom, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. And as your will, and as it is in heaven, innocent babies don't get killed. We've got to be a praying and persistent people. Now, hear me. I'm not saying we don't need to argue about this, and this is a debate, there needs to be conversations with legislators and those in power. I'm not saying that at all. What is our first line of defense? We go to the one who can do something about it. We go to God. So, the unrighteous judge is the first character. The second character we encounter is the unrelenting widow. We're going to spend some time here for a little bit. So, the first thing the unrelenting widow does, she demands her justice. Justice is one thing to be helpful uh, if you want to study Bible, I use this honor and study Bible kind of describes this in the context of widows. Uh, it says that window, widows who were a marginalized group in ancient societies are often the object of God's special love and care throughout the Gospel of Luke. And if you'll remember Anna, the prophetess, the early beginning of Luke, remember her, widow? <clears throat> Uh, so we've got Anna, we've got the widow of Nain, later in the gospel, where her son was raised. And then everybody's familiar with the widow's mite, the widow who's, who's giving her pennies uh, to contribute to the work of the Lord, and she's doing this, and others bring more. And the Lord said that she brought more. 
Long story short is that in the Gospel of Luke and in the heart of Jesus, particularly, widows are a special treasure. But they're kind of symbolizing something. They're showing some of the most marginalized and weak people. And by weak, I mean in the society that they were in. They had no leverage. And she's demanding justice of an elected official. Here's what she does. Verse 3. And there was a widow in the city who, what? She kept coming to him and saying, Give me justice against my adversary. For a, while he, for a while he refused, but afterward he said to himself, Though I neither fear God nor respect a man, we already know that. Yeah, because this widow, what? Keeps bothering me. I will give her justice so that she will not beat me down by her continual coming. So she keeps coming, verse 3. She keeps bothering him in verse 5. She will not beat me down by her continual coming, verse 5. So that beat me down in Greek literally means to strike under the eyes. Now, there's three options of how to kind of best interpret this. Here they are. First one is beat me down to mean that the judge could lose his reputation because of this widow's persistence. She's going to beat him down liberally to where he loses his office. I don't think that is a very likely interpretation because in this time, the widow would not have the authority to do this. He would have, she would have no political capital, no structure in which her voice would matter to earthly perspective. Second, the beat me down could mean that the judge is getting physically harmed. He is afraid that she is going to come sock him one right in the eye. Possible, but it's very unlikely, especially in this culture. Very unlikely this is the case. More likely is what this really means to beat me down is kind of a picture, a word picture, of a woman obtaining her request because she relentlessly is pursuing what she needs. She needs justice. She's relentless. She is unrelenting. So to apply that to us this morning. Could it be said of you? If we were honest, could it be said of you that you can keep coming to the Lord? Could it be said to you that you, you keep bringing these requests to Him? That in a sense, we're bothering God because we just keep doing it, which we'll, we'll deal with that in a second. But we keep coming to Him. We continually come to Him. Could it be said of you? Donald Whitney in his great book on spiritual discipline says this. He says, sometimes a failure to persist in prayer proves that we're not serious about the request in the first place. So the reason you're not keep coming back to God is because you're really not serious. Your heart's not in it. That's one. At other times, God wants us to persist in prayer in order to strengthen our faith in Him. Faith would never grow if all our prayers were answered immediately, would it? If every prayer we ever offered was answered immediately, our faith would grow. Persistent prayer tends to develop also deeper gravity as well. You don't have to think of this. Think of a pregnancy. Yeah, nine months is hard. It's not. Ladies, it's hard. It's hard. Your body goes through all kinds of stuff. It's painful. You can sit. Now, they're all different, but it's hard. It's very hard. And then to follow that up, you result in this terrible experience in the hospital. Um, and there's probably screaming, lots of all other kind of stuff. It's terrible. Absolutely terrible. It's painful. There is a persistence that you use. Guess what? It's not going away. But, but guess what? At the end of it, what happens? They peace. And there's joy. And there's rejoicing. In the same way, when we persist in prayer over and over, we continually go to God, isn't there a gratefulness that wells up within us? I think there is. I think there's a, a deeper gratitude when we've been laboring over prayer. George Mueller, uh, the great prayer warrior and advocate for orphans, said this. He said, The great fault of the children of God is they do not continue in prayer. They do not go on praying. They do not persevere. If they desire anything for God's glory, now hear this, if the believer, if they desire anything for God's glory, they should pray until they get it. Did you hear that? 
Oh, how good and kind and gracious and condescending is the one with whom we have to go. He has given me, as unworthy as I am, immeasurable of all I had asked or thought. We should go to him continually until we get it. We're not talking about worldly requests. We're talking about things for God's glory. So, justice is demanded regardless of her position in society. A widow in that culture was almost helpless. She didn't have family to, tend to care for her. She was almost helpless. Her only hope was that her persistent plea for justice would be granted by this judge. Her only hope. She had to go to him. So justice is demanded. It's also delivered. Justice is delivered. Regardless, and this is very important, regardless of his hard heart. Verse 4 says that she's come to him. She's asked for justice. Verse 4 says, for a while he refused. Now we don't know how long this is because it's a, it's a parable. It's a story. But I think it's trying to teach us that this has been going on for a while. This could be months. This could be years. We have no clue how long this has been going on. His heart is hard. She continues to come to him despite that. I think this is a great example for us of the power of persistent prayer. Especially when it comes to reaching the lost. So if you have a family member, it could be somebody sitting next to you in the room today. You may have a brother, a sister, an aunt, an uncle, a father, a mother, one of your own children who has rebelled against the faith. It could be your neighbor, it could be your co-worker. His heart is hard against the things of Christ. He doesn't know Him. He doesn't want to have anything to do with that. The answer for that? Persistent prayer. Take it to the Lord. Day in, day out. Believing that you it will happen. We keep going to Him. And that's what happens. So for a while, the judge refused. But guess what? Eventually, day one. The widow boldly and unashamedly pleads her case day in and day out before this earthly judge. Now, let me teach you something real quick. This parable features what, the Bible, what many Bible scholars would call an a fortiori argument. That's a million dollar word right there. A fortiori. Here's what that is. When we argue a specific point based on some larger or broader established idea, we are using a fortiori arguments. In common dialogue, we often use phrases such as even more so or all the more. The book of Hebrews rhetorically asks, if animal sacrifice has a certain spiritual effect, how much more effective is the sacrifice of Christ? Hebrews 9. This is an a fortiori argument. And that is what is happening in this parable. So, if the godless, unrighteous judge will give justice to a persistent widow, how much more will the just ruler of this world hear and answer his chosen people? The key thing to keep in mind as we move to our last section is that our God is vastly different than this judge. Completely different. So, let's look at what happens. Verse 6 through 8. And the Lord says, Jesus says, Hear what the unrighteous judge says. And will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? Will he delay over them long? Or long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? We've got a few points here. First, Lord hears the prayers of His people. So our persistence pays off. There's good news. When we persist in prayer, there's good news. First, the Lord hears the prayers of His people. When we pray as the people of God, we have the ear, the King and the Judge of all. Did you hear that? We have God's ear. He has bent down to us and He loves Second, the Lord answers the prayers of His people. When we pray, we must believe that God will answer. As we sang earlier, He 
He's a good, good father. That's who he is. We don't ask, we ask him for bread and he sends us a stone, as the scriptures teach us. That's not who he is. We believe when we pray that he will answer. The Lord answers the prayers of his chosen people. Third, the Lord brings about justice in response to the prayers of his people. When we pray, we must expect that our prayers actually matter, especially in matters of injustice. We see injustice in our world, we need to be praying and believe that our prayers actually matter and are effective. So speedily, let's talk about that real quick because you probably read that and you're just, all right, Jesus, like, you say speedily. And there's a tension there, isn't it? Because what he says and what we feel. Well, um, Dr. Schreiner uh, in his commentary explains this, I thought, in a really good way to talk about this tension. He says the best solution to this tension seems to be that the fulfillment of God's purposes are soon according to His timetable. So they're soon according to His timetable, whereas such fulfillment may seem agonizingly slow to human beings. Hence, we are tempted to give up and cease praying. So Jesus encourages His disciples to persist in prayer with the sure confidence that God would soon vindicate them. Our time is not His time. It may take a long time. We are to persist in prayer because He eventually will answer. And believe it. And one of the things Jesus is intending to do here in this a fortiori argument is that He's intending to make a contrast. Okay? So here's where it is. Listen to this. Very important. Where the judge does not fear God, nor does He respect man, our holy God, our God is holy, and He loves His people. Unrighteous judge doesn't like people. Our God is holy and loves His people. Where the judge is unrighteous, our God is righteous and will one day right every single wrong. Third, where the judge refuses to hear the plea of the hurting and the oppressed, our God is compassionate to those who come to him crying day and night. He's not like that judge. And lastly, where this judge only gives in because he's irritated, because this woman just keeps on coming, he's, he's done with it. It's not like our God. Our God is only bothered when his people do not come to him with their burdens. Our God wants us to come to him. Jesus even asked him to come who are all weary and heavy and laden. And what? I will give you rest. So Jesus intends to make a contrast because our God is not like that judge. Although we are to persist in prayer, our God is not like him. He does his people to persist and come to him. The last point is this. The coming assessment of his creation. It leads to this. There's a shift in the text. Okay, He's been talking about God, who He is, how He will answer. And then there's a shift now at the end of verse 8. And he says, Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will He find faith on earth? The answer is obviously yes. The Lord has His chosen people. People will believe, follow, trust, and faith. His promise is sure. The answer is yes, but implicit in this question is that not all will remain faithful. Yeah. Not all will. Here Jesus shifts the focus from God to His people. Since God will prove faithful to His people, His people must likewise be faithful to the end. So, when we continually pray, when we persistently pray, we are giving evidence of our faith the actual evidence of our faith. And when Jesus returns, will He find faith on earth? Yes. But we have to look inward and ask, Lord, if He was to come now, what would He see in our church? Would He see a praying people? Persistent prayer people? Or would He see an apathetic? I'd ask this question this week for myself. 
We sang a song earlier. We'll, we'll be a church ready for you. You know how we do that? By persistently praying. So if you want to be a church ready for His return, keep praying. Don't stop. Don't give up. Persist in prayer. It's Jesus is coming soon. What will our response be is the question. So, to put this in this final minute, here's an application for you. First off, for some of you here this morning, the idea of persistent prayer sounds really dangerous. And you know why? You've got a hard heart. You don't know Jesus. There's surely someone here today who does not know him. You do not know him. But guess what? It doesn't have to be that way. God sent his son, born of a virgin, living a perfect life, headed to a cross, that he would die on and pay the penalty of sin that you deserve so that you can have life. And guess what? He didn't just die, he rose again victoriously so you can have new life in him. You know what he asks of you? That faith, trust. And repent of your sins. Turn from your wicked ways and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Simple. But hard. This is not just that. You believe and you repent and you follow Him. And the way that we're talking about following Him tonight or this morning <coughs> is through persistent prayer. So our challenge, if you don't know Him today, call out to Him. Cry out to Him. Ask Him to say, Come to us after the service. We love the Father. Secondly, for those of you who love deep study and theology, reading about prayer and studying about prayer is not the same thing as prayer. That was for me. It's not the same thing. It's a great quote from Andrew Murray. He's talking about persistent prayer. He says, I want to listen for a year to a professor of music playing the most beautiful music. That won't teach me to play an instrument. <coughs> Robert Murray McShane says, A man is what he is on his knees, and nothing more, no more. Basically, what the saying is, the Lord is still looking at you right now, judging by your prayer life. What would he say? The faithfulness there? I think we all need to change there. And our last point is this. I'm going to challenge each of you this week to join me, and I'm going to give you a homework assignment. So don't write this down. It's in your notes. Set it your phone. Put a reminder. Write it down. Put it on your calendar. Put a sticky note. I want us to discipline ourselves this week to pray for two things. One, the first part of the Lord's prayer: Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. The kingdom come. Will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Pray that this week. Seven days. See what the Lord does. Second. We want to pray Psalm 67, verse 2. Lord, that your way may be known on earth and your saving power among all nations. Prayer, as Oswald Chambers says, does not fit us for the greater world. Prayer is the greater world. We can get back and walk the world. By praying, we're doing a great work of faith. So will you join me this week? Pray, not forget. Let's pray. Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Lord, may your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, Lord. May your name be lifted up as holy, Lord. May your kingdom come to this earth. May you come, Lord Jesus. Right at your wrong. Move every tear. Have your way. And not only that, Lord, but may your way be known on earth. Or that your saving power would be made known through all the nations. That people of every tribe and tongue would know that Jesus Christ is Lord as we do this morning. And Lord, I, I can't help but just want to let you know. There are probably some here this morning that have heard me. Life is hard. But the good news is, Lord, you promised it. So we, should, we shouldn't be surprised, but it's still hard. So, Lord, 
one of the ways we taught us to predict that is to continually come to you. Good Father, who loves to hear from his people. Lord, may, us, may we, this week, as your people, persistently come to you. And Lord, as the video said over here, we don't come by our own righteousness. We come by the righteousness of Jesus. Not by our righteousness, not by ours, Lord, but by yours. So Lord, may that give us boldness and confidence as we approach you this week. Lord, we are thankful 